Well, good morning, everybody. It's really wonderful to be here with you. And uh, Helen, that was a magnificent speech. Um, I commend you. And, you know, this is just the culmination of three years where you've really led the profession. I think that the RCGP is arguably the most important college. And so... <laughs> So there's no doubt in my mind, though, that the college's standing and the value of its contributions are in large measure down to your constant hard work, Helen, and your incredible leadership. So I would like to add my congratulations to all of yours, to Helen, for these amazing three years. But more than that, I really want to start by thanking all of you here. First of all, for coming to hear me. I know you didn't really come to hear me speak. You came to hear Helen, but for coming and waiting to hear me speak. But for everything that you do every day for all the patients out there, I think your hard work, your individual leadership is really a tribute to the ethos of the NHS. And you have led by example, by carrying on in very difficult circumstances. At the GMC, we really do see the pressures on the system, not least the impact of rising patient demand against a background of recruitment and retent uh, retention challenges and limited funding. I'm going to talk in a minute about how we as a regulator are working across the system to influence change. And it's, these are the changes that you need if you want to deliver excellence in patient care every single day of your working lives. For most of us, the standard of care that we deliver to our patients is by far the most potent driver. That dedication matters deeply to me, and I am proud of having been a good doctor for 40 years, and I want all of you to be able to feel the same way. Today, I'm going to touch on the environment in which you work. I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, how general practice is showing up in our workforce survey. I want to look at what we might be able to do in terms of attracting, educating, and supporting all of those who choose to work in general practice. And I'm going to try and give an indication of how we will continue as the GMC and your regulator to influence the system in which you work. Most importantly, at the end, I'll come back to where I started, which is to leadership and the importance of just not the likes of Helen or in the future Martin, but the importance of each one of us showing leadership and valuing the people with whom we work. Medicine has always been challenging and it always will be, but GPs get to experience firsthand many of the complexities affecting modern healthcare. You are the first port of call for the patients, and they are living longer with more complex conditions. Patients are experiencing the effect of inequalities, and those are resulting in poor health choices. Then, as Helen mentioned, there's new technology, and sometimes it helps, but sometimes it seems to get in the way of the effective patient experience. Its potential to improve and reduce your daily workload is enormous, but the issue would seem to be that harnessing the, that advanced technology, which makes sense and which adds value and facilitates the patient experience, can be a challenge. Now, those challenges have been recognised, and all across the UK, there are strategies uh, focusing on integrating health community and social care. And the GMC increasingly is using our data to inform these strategies. And I'm going to just share a few aspects of that data with you. We have about 300,000 people on our, our register and 250,000 of those have a license to practice. You, general practice, are 71,374 as of the day that we took this poll. That's almost a quarter of our licensed workforce. 
general practice uh, register grew by about 4% in terms of pure numbers, but you heard from Helen that that may not be the case in terms of full-time equivalents. And that was in the six year be between 2.12 and 2.18. That is still very much slower than the specialist register, which grew by 11%. And I'll come back to the two registers later. Now, the significant, the significant shortage of GPs is a real concern to us because we see that you are finding that you want to reduce your hours and retire early. And we know that the, the increase on the register is not evenly distributed. So in England, there was a 6.8% rise. That's over 3,200 GPs. But at the same time, in Northern Ireland and Scotland, it only rose by 3.1% and 1% respectively. And those of you who are working in Wales and feel that pressure, sadly, the, it's a reflection of the fact that, in fact, there was a decrease of 1.1% in the number of GPs in Wales. As Helen mentioned, there is positive news. There are 6% more GPs in training than there were in previous years. But you have a way to go before you achieve your target figures. So how can we help? And as uh, you heard, both the BMA and your Royal Colleges recognize uh, that GPs are expert generalists and GP training is rigorous and that doctors uh, who are in general practice make a massive contribution to our health service. But even so, there are these two separate registers, one for so-called specialists and one for general practitioners. And this means that the expertise is often not recognised in the same way as it is with other specialties. And to be honest, there is, in, within the medical community, still some very old-fashioned snobbery about GP training and workforce. So we have been working very much with your college and actively encouraging the Department of Health and Social Care to look at bringing everybody together on a single advanced register. That would simplify the structure and it would make crystal clear the parity of expertise held in this room and across UK general practice. We've also started to explore with partners additional flexibility that might be within the performance list in England, further segmenting the performance list and including other groups of doctors could support retention of retiring or returning GPs and allowing them to work with a limited scope of practice if that's what they choose to do. There could also be potential for development of specialty cohorts where non-GPs could work in a limited primary care role. In addition to all that, we're working with your college on international recruitment. And that, in particular, is looking at trying to streamline some of the differences where uh, curricula such as those in Australia can be matched to our curricula, making it simpler for people from those jurisdictions. And they're often people who have gone over from the UK and trained in general practice in, in Australia, making it easier for them to return to the general, general practice register in this country. There's no doubt that international doctors make a huge commitment to our health service by choosing to come to the UK. And if we really want to make general practice an attractive prospect, we must work to remove some of the barriers which have been used to, so that their skills are not recognised. And our data suggests that they're actually not getting the support in general that they need. Large volumes of international graduates under the age of 50 are leaving the UK. Now, some of that will be because they've come to the UK for specialist training. But in other cases, they are still reporting bullying or lack of training opportunities as being why, having come in expectation, they either return home or move to other countries. If we could only hold on to those doctors for a little bit longer and persuade them into general practice, that might make a huge benefit to patient care. There is another barrier, and that is the SEGBA process. It's unwieldy and time-consuming. Very often, you have to wade through a complete rainforest of papers if you're one of the assessors. Uh, we ask our colleagues to provide a 1,000 pages of documentation. It costs about £1,500. It takes more than nine months to complete. And at the end of it, 
maybe you've only got a 50-50 chance of getting onto the register. We really do need a different approach to this sort of, uh, and, uh, this sort of uh, assessment, and um, sadly, legislation in the Medical Act will be the only way that we can uh, change it. At the moment, most of our aspects are covered by the 1983 Medical Act, and that is clearly not fit for purpose. We need to make it easier to bring in trained doctors as well as the young doctors who come. And indeed, there are about 7,300 international doctors coming this last year at a junior stage. So if it were only a little easier to, and a little more, more straightforward to register uh, doctors with expertise, we could make a significant difference to the numbers who want to come into general practice. And a simple law change would help with that, uh, that process. And I know that the Royal College of General Practitioners supports us in that, and I am deeply grateful for that support because we need all the help that we can. Now, I want to say that most doctors don't know an awful lot about our role in terms of education, both undergraduate and postgraduate, about our standard setting at the GMC, and they only think of us as the holder of a register and our fitness to practice processes. Sadly, complaints about doctors and fitness to practice takes up a disproportionate amount of our time, and we know that general practitioners and psychiatrists are complained about more than any other specialty. Now, some of that, I think, is due to the sorts of cases and the patient groups with whom you deal. However, some of the complaints are avoidable, and the GMC outreach teams are a resource that are available for you. Uh, for example, we should, our data now shows quite clearly that international medical graduates are sometimes the subject of complaints in a relatively short time after joining the UK register. And adapting to UK practice can be hard. There's a significant cultural difference practicing medicine in other countries as compared to the NHS, and it can be difficult to adjust. So we now offer free workshops designed to help new doctors sometimes your doctors in general practice training, for instance, and this will offer practical guidance and ethical scenarios and a chance to connect with fellow doctors who have also just arrived in the country. We want to see doctors getting ahead and dealing with potential problems rather than ending up in our fitness to practice processes. And I do feel that I need to dispel some myths about fitness to practice. Of the nearly 8,500 complaints relating to all doctors in the last year, uh, only about 2,000 of those went on to be investigated, and 350 of those roughly went to a tribunal hearing. Uh, those numbers vary year on year, and currently we are actually back up to the numbers that were referred about five years ago. So it's not that those referrals are massively increasing. In the last year, only around 150 cases uh, out of the 250,000 doctors with a license to practice, only about 150 were suspended or removed. And overall, and this is really interesting, only four were related to pure issues of clinical competence. The others were either due to pre-existing criminal convictions, gross and persistent behavioral issues, dishonesty or health issues impacting on the doctor's performance and their fitness to practice. And fitness to practice is not about punishment. It looks forward, and it is a doctor's standing and the public's confidence in that doctor continuing to practice. So as I said, there was some mixed news about GPs and about the complaints. GPs over the age of 50 are in the group that are most likely to get a complaint. That's about one in five of you. But the good news is that you are not more likely to get investigated or sanctioned or warned. In fact, only about 14% in general of general practice. And given the numbers that you are, that actually makes the risk even lower. Now, we can do things, and we have done some work, to try and reduce the burden of full investigations. And as single clinical incidence is quite 
a common reason for a referral, particularly in general practice. We've had a two-year pilot trying to reduce the number of full investigations on single clinical incidents. And what we found is that we have been able to dismiss 200 of such cases without a massive investigation, which would have taken months and months, simply by paying more attention at an early stage to medical records, in independent expert input, doctors' uh, input from their responsible officers, and indeed doctors themselves. We really want to reduce the burden for doctors, and this pilot tells us one way we can do that. As it happens, it also frees up resource so we can look at the more serious cases uh, more efficiently. Looking to the future, general practice in 2020 will be asked to work with technology advancing at a pace that's never seen before, and a world of increased in in interconnection, 4.5 billion internet users all ready to use Dr. Google and all knowing the right answer to whatever the consultation is they're about to have with you. But making sense of this change is your college advocates for your patients and the GMC will continue to work with you to produce standards for safe delivery of patient care. Skills and labour are at a shortage in a global health market. GPs must be able to fulfil their duties whilst working with those who can assist them by undertaking duties that GPs are able to delegate to those people. For that reason, we are immensely happy that we've been asked by the Department of Health to regulate physicians' associates. We already know that this small but growing group of intelligent, educated, and highly motivated workforce will, if brought under regulation, be able to augment and assist you GPs as you deliver the care you wish to deliver. We hope that we'll have that system up and running when the legislation, and we know the, the health warning on legislative change, but when that legislation is forthcoming, which will probably be in the next couple of years. More than anything, we know that we must take care of you, all of you who work in general practice. Our data from the training survey, from health surveys, shows us that there are concerning trends about doctors' well-being. Half of all GPs surveyed in our workforce report said they work beyond rotated hours and feel unable to cope on a weekly basis. Amongst the building blocks of a sustainable workforce must be a renewed focus on improving your well-being and workplaces, driven by a step change, step change in culture and enhanced leadership. Work pressure, lack of supportive cultures and burnout are key risks to the retention and sustainability of the medical workforce. Workforce strategies must prioritise and, uh, and support inclusive working arrangements. The themes front and centre from the review we asked Michael West and Denise Coyer conduct, that is the mental health and wellbeing review, uh, are around the workforce support. We aim to publish this work in November and Sadly, it shows that general practice has its share of well-being issues. Part of Dame Denise and Michael's work has been to identify and highlight great examples of organisations already taking steps to improve doctor welfare. At present, there is no consistency across the United Kingdom, and this review aims to change that. We need the RCGP's influence and reach to spread the word about the benefits of a positive working environments can bring to doctors and patients. All the evidence indicates that organizations who prioritize staff welfare and the, the show leadership at a high level will improve levels of patient satisfaction. The Mental Health and Wellbeing Report provides practical recommendations and workable examples of how to tackle workplace factors behind poor well-being, and it aims to help leaders to develop more compassionate ways of working. Failure to change risks more good doctors leaving and missing the golden opportunity to, to develop a sustainable workshop force. We know that medicine has always been hard. We know it always will be, but we must stop making it harder 
and that needs to be by getting the basics right. So this report identifies that effective clinical leadership is essential to make change happen. Good and well-supported clinical leadership can bring huge benefits to doctors and to the wider clinical workforce and patients' experience in healthcare. We know that there is ample evidence for this and that conversations about development and inspiring people and empowering people and treating them with dignity can make a difference. We shouldn't expect medical leaders to be born, so we need to train them. I know as a doctor and a medical director, it can make a difference and we need to support doctors to remain good doctors and deal with unprofessional behavior and we need them to understand that they can get help from their professional bodies and from their regulator. We know, and West points this out, that the, uh, there needs to be consistent application of best practice across the United Kingdom if we are to make the NHS the best place to work. I've talked a lot about what we need to do in the health service. We know that there are pressures. There are some positive news about increasing numbers. The GMC is aiming to pull every lever to improve the things that we do. We're going to be active in terms of uh, training international recruits and getting legislative change. Where we don't have control, we will continue to influence that change. Things like the single register or changing the procedural barriers. The, your professional body, the RCP, will continue to advocate for you. and um, It will make general practice a um, great place to work. But the NHS needs to up its game. It needs to take seriously the responsibilities of being an effective and facilitating employer. And government needs to deliver long-awaited reforms to legislation. Working together, we will achieve positive change. Once again, my thanks to you, amazing doctors, for all you already do, and I hope you will enjoy the rest of this conference. Thank you. Thank you.